You can forget a lot of things, Foster Care Nation, but never forget this. You're listening to Unparalleled Studios. Studios. That's it now. Foster Care Nation! Listen up. This is Foster Care and Unparalleled Journey! Strength for the powerless. Courage for the fearful. Hope and healing for wounded hearts. Hello and welcome back to Foster Care and Unparalleled Journey with Jason and Noah Amanda. Again, I know you guys are probably getting tired of listening to just me and not having her in here, but she's off doing that grown up thing again. And I'm over here playing on the computer and pushing buttons and finding people to talk to on the internet that are interesting. So yeah, I got the good deal. I know. Don't tell her. Don't tell her. Uh, <laughs> today I have Jennifer Blanchett with me. Um, Jennifer, how you doing? I'm good. How are you? Awesome. Doing awesome. All right. Well, we're always looking for interesting people who have an interesting take on things that we hadn't thought about before. And you definitely have an interesting take on on this world because you came to it as as a caseworker. So you saw this from a whole different lens. Yeah. Yeah. So while I was actually studying for I'm a clinical psychologist now. And while I was studying for that, well, before that program, I would say I worked as a foster care, therapeutic foster care caseworker in Virginia. And then as a foster parent trainer, and and I didn't add this, and then when I I moved to New York City, outside of New York City, and I worked as a foster care casework supervisor for about a year. So I did work in and around foster care for quite some time, and I found it just a really, well, first we know, underserved. And for the foster parents, certainly just educating i think regarding what they can expect as a foster parent trainer i think was a huge task because a lot of there was a lot of variability in knowledge about foster care children some came in with a lot of experience and some none at all so i think that's a little bit of you know previous to becoming a psychologist my experience in the foster care world yeah (laughs) because we walked into this with all kinds i mean we had buckets empty with no knowledge in it at all (laughs) an experience that was Mm. um not there and we walked into this not having really much of a clue as to what we're going to do other than our you know in missouri they have a stars program i believe is what it's called is the stars training and most states i assume have their own little training program where they give you some level of training and that's that's nice that they do that i mean it's it's good it's important that, that that's there but at the same time can you really prepare somebody for this journey no no, I, they and every kid's different too, right? So they could, the one foster family could have one placement and have one experience, and that child had needed certain resources or certain things from them. The next child could be completely different. So I think it really is just as, and now I'm a, a parent. So I think of myself back then, I was training as not a parent either. So I kind of liken it to my parenting experience now. And I had a little rough go of it in my own parenting coming into, you know, parenting, certainly. But every child, you know, each one of my children are different. And when I became a parent, even as a psychologist, foster parent trainer, all those credentials, nothing could have prepared me for that responsibility. And that's for neurotypical children, right? Yeah. So you add the other layer, layers of the needs that foster care children just require. That's it's just another level. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Because you know our family. You know, anybody who knows our story knows that our family is made up of many children who've come to us many different ways. You know, and some of it has some biology, some of it has some family ish connections, some of it is just strictly foster or adoptive. And so, what does your family look like today? My new, my family here, mm-hmm. my personal family, yeah. So I have two boys, and my husband and I are raising those two boys here in the state of Maine. And we also have a border collie who's also a therapy dog, who my children utilize, who I utilize. <laughs> 
my clients utilize. Mm-hmm. So he is always part of like treating everybody and wherever he goes. So he's a big part of our emotional health here and my clients too, which is kind of fun. So that's kind of what my family looks like. I'm just jealous that your border collie is, is helpful because we had one years ago who, unfortunately, she was just too smart for me. That's what I eventually You're learned. You're very smart. Well, you know, when I was raised kind of with an old school parents, right? And if the dog messes on the floor, you rub their nose in it. And, and, and I learned pretty early on that's probably not the best way to do things. So the dog, you know, has an accident, you immediately get him outside, right? Yeah. And that sounds like great advice. The problem is, is when you have a dog who loves to be outside, eventually she learns that if she wants to go outside, she just has to run up, stand in front of you and pee on the floor. That's oh, what she, nice. how she trained me. <laughs> That's a fun way to do it. Yeah, she was smarter than me. She <laughs> trained me. And um, let's be honest, our kids probably do the same thing on some level. They're training us too. We just don't always realize it. Mm, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I know that you also you have a podcast that you uh, that you run called the TB, TBI Therapist Podcast, and what's that about? Let's let's talk about that just a little bit because um, traumatic brain injuries are something that I know a little bit more than I want to know about. Yeah, so I started the podcast out of after working with brain injury, concussion, acquired brain injury, stroke. I'm including a lot of those. That's not comprehensive. But I think under the umbrella of acquired brain injury. And I found that many of the people I worked with over those 10 years, when they got to working with me, their mental health concerns were neglected. It was an afterthought. Or they were kind of felt like it's all, it's just in your head and it's kind of more anxiety now. This isn't due to your brain injury. So the idea of the podcast was to promote stories of people who are in whatever stage of recovery they're in, their journey of how they kind of got through this, how they're getting through this, because, you know, for many people after brain injury, it is a lifelong recovery process. And they're always going to be working on the recovery, much like with trauma recovery. It's not like we're ever done with it with trauma recovery. I'm also a trauma specialist as well. So I kind of think of these two, the brain injury recovery and the trauma recovery is very kind of similar in, in nature in some ways, emotionally. So I wanted to highlight that, to highlight the needs of this population and also to reduce some stigma. You know, a lot of with this type of injury, it's invisible and many people don't understand like, oh, you just had a concussion. Like, okay, so aren't you back to normal or you look great? And then, <laughs> meanwhile, the person with the concussion is like, thanks. I don't know what to say to that because I feel like crap. Oh, and yeah. uh, so part of that is education, I think, for the public a little bit to let them know that, hey, th- just because someone said, like, says they, they look fine, rather, they look fine on the outside, we can't assume that everything is fine inside. And to just be curious about people's experience and to hopefully reduce some of the shame and the stigma associated with continuing to struggle with a chronic condition or chronic mental health issue you know i hadn't really thought about the stroke piece uh as being part of that but it's interesting that you mentioned that because well the doctors aren't 100 percent sure at this point um what two mris ago the doctor said that they the neurologist said she counted six strokes in my brain wow um, yeah significant right mm-hmm. the fact that i can walk and talk is is pretty significant after that the last mri the doctor says i'm not certain they're all strokes that we see and it may have something to do with some light matter changes due to demyelinization disorder it could be something like ms or something else but you know as as i've walked this journey i've had things show up right i have things like i get migraines now that are oh my gosh And, and people i never understood migraines amanda my wife has has dealt with migraines as long as i've known her off and on Mm-hmm. And man, when I get them, whew, like a bad one might last two or three days. It might, it's, it's pretty significant. I've, I've got my, my work bag over here with, with my migraine medication and I've got a box up there of it to keep me, um, you know, taken care of at home. I have some in, in my vehicle at work and because when it hits, it's significant. 
And people, you can't see that when somebody's, you know, other than, than my wonderful coworkers occasionally looking at me and going, you look like crap. <laughs> <laughs> what do you say to that even, right? Right. Thanks. Thank you. I would yeah. really wanted to know that today. <laughs> yeah. Normally I just, just say, yeah, I feel like crap too, man. <laughs> I feel pretty horrible today. So why don't you mm. just step back and leave me alone? Let me have some quiet over here. But, but you know, these are the sorts of things that people don't see. They don't know that they're there. They don't. Yeah. And I think speaking of migraines, especially, so headache is one of, and fatigue are probably the biggest symptoms that I see after a brain injury. And managing those, I think, can be quite difficult because there's no clear cut treatment for migraines. You probably know this. You know, there's, mm-hmm. <laughs> I know there's things they tell you to do, but in general, there's a lot of lifestyle changes that need to happen. And that's with brain injury recovery too, trauma recovery, a lot of kind of brain specific illness or, you know, neurodevelop- neurodevelopmental issues. It is more about lifestyle to kind of optimize brain health in general or physical health. Yeah. So I found that the solution is just to drink lots and lots of caffeine, right? Generally, that's like top recommendation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's been that's one of the few things that seems to work for me. And I, I you know, and, and you know, we're here talking about foster kids and, and kids in adoption and things like that. And, you know, and as much as most people who know me don't realize that I've had a significant number of strokes, whatever that is, potentially have some other disorder going on in my brain. Uh, you know, when you meet these kids, you don't know who's been through traumatic brain injuries, you know, due to abuse, possibly neglect, God only knows what, you don't know that you're dealing with these sorts of things when they walk into your door. Cause you know, typically it's a caseworker who walks into the door with a kid or two and says, Oh, hi, you know, here we go. Here you go, little buddy. This, this guy's, his name is Mr. Jason. And this is, this is Amanda. And, and we just pulled him out of his house and that's the level of detail you get. Right. Right. I remember doing those kind of uh, visits as a caseworker when we'd get, you know, while we, a child would come into care and we didn't have much information on them at all. And the parents, of course, wanted more information than than that. And hats off to foster parents who open their home and just to the unknown person, child, who they don't know what they're going to struggle with. But that's you're right. You're so right. You never know kind of what you're going to get or what the child will be dealing with. Yeah, the the kid shows up at your house and they bring a whole bucket of things oftentimes to your home, especially we, we primarily take in younger kids. Um, that's just kind of been the way that, that our family has been wired to, uh, to handle younger ones better. And they tend to fit into our d- dynamics here a little bit better. And the thing about young kids is they can't tell you that, you know, I've been hit in the head enough times, you know, I was beat with something solid or they, they have no way of mm-hmm. really formulating that as a story to give you. you know, a lot of times that comes out of the case or the course of a case, but, but oftentimes they walk in and you don't know that you've got that in front of you. And right. so you've got a kid who's, who's had some of the stuff that, you have to fig, kind of figure out along the way. So what sorts of things do you, do you recommend for foster parents or adoptive parents or anybody in general, you know, teachers, caseworkers, anybody's listening who deals with, with a vulnerable population, what do you look out for? Yeah. So, you know, I, I think it's hard to think about like initially in a placement doing you know, the intensive kind of things you might think about for, you know, understanding what's going on kind of from a neurodevelopmental perspective. So I'm trying to think like, are we thinking of like an initial placement or maybe after they've been there a while, maybe give me a little direction, if you will. Well, I mean, when kids first show up, obviously there's always like that, they like to call it honeymoon period, but truth be known, it's usually like that walking on eggshells moment where we don't, we don't know each other very well yet. Yeah. And I mean, you take one look at me and, and when you're three foot tall and you're looking at me over six foot and I'm a, you know, the big scary guy with a weird haircut and and a big black beard and and a deep voice and and they tend to be a little bit nervous at first and so as as you get to know a kid though what what do you look out for to to have some idea that you might be dealing with some of those sorts of things yeah so i think 
if or certainly if we if we've known there's been falls in childhood so sometimes in the case history you'll see that there has been a significant fall that could have been due to neglect often not, so even if it was a neglect case and that we know that maybe the child there's like an, some evidence of the child falling downstairs due to neglect or abuse I think that's certainly an indicator if we know that there was definitely a blow to the head at some point in their history to get them further evaluation and potentially a neuropsychological examination. Uh, so that might be like one of those red flag things to think they, they're probably we're probably going to want some more understanding of cognition about this kiddo. So second is when there's a lot of cognitive symptoms, which can be muddied, of course, by trauma symptoms, right? Because there's you know, you have reduced processing speed, you have reduced attention with kids with trauma and ADHD and in foster care children, I won't, it's, it's very muddy as well because that an, a kid who's ADHD can look like all kinds of other things because they haven't, you know, been a pro- properly cared for. But I think if we know there's a diagnosis of ADHD with a foster child, I'd love them to have some kind of cognitive assessment be seen by a neuropsychologist or by neurology to get a good look on their neurological functioning as well to see if there's anything that you might want to know as the foster parent to get them, you know, better help. And sometimes those wait lists, unfortunately, are, you know, months and months and months out. But potentially that intervention can mean so much for that child because early intervention for these neurological issues, their brain is going through so much development and there's neuroplasticity. We know that in children, their brains are much more able to recover and change and grow than an adult brain. So I think, you know, those are some of the red flags or some of the issues that I think about specifically for, you know, wanting a child to have an evaluation you know, certainly like there's OT and speech in schools. So you can push as the parent to say, if you're noticing the cognitive issues to say to the school at the IEP meeting, Hey, I really think they need an occupational therapy evaluation here in school or speech therapy. If there's memory issues or speech production, receptive, um, speech, like if they're not understanding speech, that's your receptive language abilities. So to have a speech or an OT eval completed on that child in the schools, because they're already in the school anyway. So that's probably the easiest, like the neurological and the neuropsych are probably much harder to put in place. But I think as the foster parent, I know sitting on those, I don't know if they're IEPs where you are, that's what they were called in Virginia, Mm -hmm. the IOP or the 504 plans, you know, they, they do really to take stock in what the foster parents are telling you. But I think oftentimes foster parents, some, not all, because I had some foster parents who would just be like, no, we need this, this, this. And I was like, go foster parent. You are awesome. I love you. You are a super advocate. But I want to empower foster parents that ask the questions, even if you're not sure you know, just say like, this is going on. Can they have an OT assessment? All they can say is no, right? And you can continue to push for that. But a lot of times I think foster parents maybe are like, okay, there's all these people in this room and I don't even know what to do here. (laughs) I don't know if you have experience of those meetings and. Oh yeah. Yeah. We actually have just had one of those meetings, I think last week, um, for baby girl staying with us right now, but she just turned a year old. So we're not, we're not ready for any, anything like that at this point. But I'll tell you what, that's one thing that, that you mentioned, I think is so important. And that is to realize that your voice is only heard if you speak up. Yes. It's so easy to walk into court and be ignored by a judge, by the lawyers, or, or by caseworkers that they they don't you know want to hear what you have to say necessarily. And uh, I'm sorry, but you're going to hear me. Good. And I have the, I have that ability to stand up and have presence, right? Not everyone is comfortable standing up in a room full of people and speaking their mind out loud and making certain that everybody gets to hear them. But sometimes there's a skill set there that's just the importance of of being willing to do what needs to be done, even when it's uncomfortable. Right. And and I think that's so good. And I think sometimes if we're thinking, I'm, thought, I'm thinking of myself as a caseworker at 26. So this was, I wouldn't say how many years ago. We were talking almost decades, plural. But... My younger self, I felt very unsure of myself. Many of the caseworkers are often very young. 
you know, there's some that are older, more experienced, more seasoned. So in court, I often felt as the caseworker felt very inexperienced. And I'm in this court environment new to me. At the end of my casework experience, I felt like I could speak up more. So if that's telling you even the caseworker feels like they can't speak up, then who's going to speak for this child? And it doesn't matter how you sound. I think it's just that voice of saying, this is what's going on. I'm seeing X, Y, and Z. I'm very concerned about whatever it is. You don't have to use fancy language, but just voice your concern in whatever yeah. in whatever arena you're in yeah because i've seen so many people who who are nervous because the judge has a robe on and um you know you can go buy a robe and walk around the house and get get used to wearing a robe and feel special if you want if that helps you but the truth is 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 that the judge is worth a dang they want to hear what the parents have to say and if you raise your hand to speak they'll let you speak yeah and, and if the judge isn't you can still speak out loud in court and and make certain that, that the interest of the best kid is served to the best of your ability. And I have not yet found a judge in my experience who's willing to just shut me down and say, we don't want to hear anything from you. You're just a fool who sees them every day and knows what goes on on a daily, regular basis. And, and we know everything over here since we, we read a, a court document once every three months. Because mm-hmm. right. so often that's the case, you know, and even yeah. the guardian ad litems. Mm-hmm. They'll see them, ours. what, like a week or like three days before the court date? Yeah. Right? I'm like, okay, the, what's going on? All right. See you in court. Peace out. A lot of the guardians, you know, never meet the kids. And they're they're supposed to be advocating for their best interest. And, and that's, that's a struggle sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, it makes me sometimes want to like just show up and be like, hey, we're going to take a half hour of your time just so you can get to know this kid a little bit, you know? Um, you're, you're getting paid by the by the county to to advocate for this kid. So you're going to spend 30 minutes of your time getting to know him a little bit and know what, what's going on in their life. Now, like I mentioned, mostly Amanda and I, we, we deal with younger kids. And so that's not always very productive or necessary, but especially if you're dealing with teens, you know, these kids, they have thoughts too. Oh, definitely. And they need to be taken into account. And mm. we're not always great at, at that. It's just a, as, as one of the parts of this system that I think is a little bit broken. And honestly, I think that's the the brokenness of the system, I think, had me ultimately work elsewhere because I felt so ineffectual and I felt like I was perpetuating like the trauma that the system was putting upon these kiddos and they still need to be served. So there's a tension of those two things of doing the work and knowing that the, the system you're in is causing harm. Yeah, and I hate to admit that, you know, nobody likes to talk a lot about the some of the problems in the system because there's lots of problems. There, there's abusive foster parents. There's people who are in it just for the money. Although I always scratch my head at those folks because you can make money a lot easier doing yeah, less work. Um, not I agree. <laughs> I, think it's, I think foster parent is, parenting is one of the hardest jobs I've ever come across. Yeah, it it really needs to be a calling. It's not much of a job I, that I can see, but so many, uh, so many, so many stories out there about people who aren't chasing down the best interests of the kids in your home. You know, and a great example is a little girl who stayed with us a while back. Um, she ended up back with her mom. She's one of the handful of success stories where we found where reunification was the goal. Mom got herself clean. As far as I know, she got herself clean and stayed clean. And she got her daughter back and she's raising her kid again. And that's, that's like what we're here for. Yeah. Yeah. That's, and that's, and I believe me, I saw those success stories. I saw really successful adoptions and placements where the kid was thriving. And we don't talk about those enough either where, and that's what you have to have to have to focus on. I think as a foster parent, because if you're focused on, the children and the placements that you just felt like you did a horrible job and you didn't, but you might feel that way. You might feel like I didn't do a good job with that kiddo. That placement wasn't successful. And that was like a hot mess. It's easy to focus on those, but it's, I think even more important to focus on the good work that you have done, even in the messy cases, even in the cases you felt like you didn't do good. I've heard so many stories about Foster children who remembered a placement was really stable, 
even though they maybe blew up the placement or ran away or, you know, acted out like in severe ways. But they called the foster parent back and they said, thank you for really being really a soft place for me to fall, even though I couldn't appreciate it at the time. They could later see that that time in your home was a blessing to them, was really supportive and was healing in a way even though the foster parent may feel like I didn't, I, there's nothing good I did for that kid. And that felt really bad. You know, just the other day I was at the grocery store here locally and ran across a kid who had been in our home when he was about 15 mm-hmm. and he stayed with us for a short time. And then one evening he, he tried to, he tried to, to buck up and get a little physical with my wife and my two older boys who were one was a little bit older than him and had been wrestling for several years and the other was a little bit younger but much larger than him and they you know my sons are like getting ready to like lay the smack down and mm-hmm. I had to <laughs> had to call them down and say boys you don't know this woman like I do she's capable I she's capable but everything got a little bit sideways and ended up we had to in, you know find a different placement because he just wasn't safe in our home because he had he had stepped over a boundary that my kids just could not get past and yeah. uh, and when i saw this young man he he mentioned to me you know that, that he had stayed with us for several months you know three or six months or something and i remember that placement i remember it well he was a young guy who'd been through a lot more than he's ever told um yeah. certain of that and and the truth was he only stayed with us for five weeks I remember that so specifically because the day after we had to disrupt that placement, I think it's the only placement we've ever had to disrupt. And so I remember it really well. And I talked to the worker and I said, I'm sorry, I had to call you last night with so much like all this all of a sudden. She goes, no, no, you don't understand. That's the longest placement he's ever had. Oh, wow. Five weeks was the longest he'd stayed anywhere because he, and just like you mentioned, he, he, he tended to blow up placements and, and he had a lot of other trauma and things going on. And, and we just didn't understand, you know, his, his world very well. And, and to see him now, like, as he remembers it, it was a, it was a calm place where he stayed for three to six months. And I'm like, yeah, it was barely one month, but that, that's what he remembers. You know, that was the stability that, that he experienced. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I I think that was a gift you gave him, even as disruptive as it might have been to you and your family, that that was a gift you gave that child. Yeah. And now I'm just going to mention, you, you mentioned uh, age a minute ago. He He's old enough now that he's, he's married and has a child of his own. And I was like, yeah, I'm getting old. I don't like this feeling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. But, but, you know, to see kids who, who have made it through, you know, through that hard spot and who are starting to grow and become young adults and create their own families, it, it just brings some hope in your life that, hey, we're, we're working with kids and, and we're, we're making a difference in this world. And and that's like you mentioned, that's the good. That's what we can do that, that's going to help out. Yes. And I and I would say, you know, also having the specialty with brain injury and concussion and understanding brains very well specific to trauma if you've had a traumatic experience with a placement often that is stored in your brain very readily because it's there for your survival so if you've had a kid who's come at you you're going to remember that when you get a placement you're going to think oh my gosh this placement's going to be like that and i'm going to feel threatened and i'm scared so our brains are primed for survival they're not they're they don't readily think about those kind of really easy placements and where like, you know, they incorporated pretty well into your family or there was relatively less conflict. So I think it's important just to remember that it's harder to remember those placements that didn't have as much riffraff. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and yeah, listeners can't see me, but you know, I actually have kids tattooed all over me. Um, all the ones I own are on my left arm. And if baby girl stays long term, I'm running out of real estate. I've got to figure out where I'm going to be able to squeeze her on that arm as well. That's what I told my wife. I think we can't take it. We can't adopt any more kids at this point. I'm running out of room on my, on my tattoo <laughs> arm. <laughs> I'm just not going to be able to do it anymore. But, but you know, I, I have some of those kids actually tattooed other places on me. One little guy tattooed right over my heart. Baby Carl, not his real name, but that that was his nickname in our house was Baby Carl. And Baby mm-hmm. Carl was one of those placements where everything was just just right. And mm-hmm. it was it was a year 
yeah, he was with us for right at a year. It was just a year of of a pleasant kid. I mean, he was one of the happiest babies I've ever met. And that was just crazy to see how 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 well that went and, and what a wonderful experience it was. And, and we try to remember those because they are the ones that you can look back on with so much fondness and, and heartbreak at the end, you know, sure. because he, he went to a good placement. He went to a family member and she was mm-hmm. a good woman. But, you know, as much as we love the fact that he went to a family member, he gets to be attached to his family of origin. But we, you know, we, we had to experience that loss, but that's, that's part of what we do, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's super hard, <laughs> but yes, yeah. yes. I think it's like letting kind of letting love flow, like wherever it goes in a way, you know, that you had, you loved him, you cared for him then. And you know that that love is continuing in a different place. And so, yeah, I kind of get all spiritual in that way. Certainly <laughs> with that type of thing. But yeah, that, that's, and that's, I think you kind of have to, because it's, it's so easy. So many people have said, I could never do that. I could never let them go. I'm like, no, trust me, the, the authorities will, they'll make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we will. No, yeah. not, I, that's not me anymore. I used to be a caseworker, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I find foster parents have like, you know, their, certainly their process, but I think they kind of ultimately will come to that, that grieving period will kind of come to an end where there's more love than pain associated with that loss yeah yeah just like you know baby crawls the one we talk about a lot but you know i've got a couple other kids tattooed over here on the other side of my chest who have a who have a long story they were with us for a year and a half and and to see them leave was that was hard but Mm. at the end of the day you know these these kids are hard but it's worth it right it's it's worth it these are the Mm -hmm. stories that that have been written on our lives you know and it's uh I'm a little bit of a of a nut around the tattoo stuff, right? Because you know, some people think it's weird, and and that's fine. Anybody can think what they want to think, but but these are some of the stories that have that have made our family who we are. Yeah. And as I, I've watched my um, some of my my older kids who are now adults themselves, you know, I have I have um, three of them that have made it past twenty. And so you know, they look back on some of these stories and man, it's, it's such a part of who our family has been. And it's, it's some of those reminders that, man, this, this, some of this was really hard, but it was really worth it. And I, I wouldn't trade it for anything. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's what, I think that's what the beautiful thing of it is. I always remember this family I worked with in Virginia and their Thanksgiving and Christmases were like, you know, they're like block parties because everyone would come back. And I think that was the beautiful thing to see. And they would, t- they would have like four placements at a time, often three or four. I don't know how many they would keep, but they just did so well with a certain, like it was teenage boys. And they just, they just had a way with teenage boys and they kept taking placements and they kept doing really well with that and the kids got what they needed out of that experience. And I think their holidays is a, is a testament to that. Certainly. Yeah. And I would imagine some of your favorite people, if they can take care of teenage boys that well, because that's one of those populations that I think is a lot largely underserved because teen boys can be difficult. I was, I was a teen boy and what you might have called a fairly neurotypical teen boy that didn't have any you know i was raised in my family of origin with my biological mother and father and and i was a difficult kid and i didn't have a whole lot of excuses to be a challenging kid but i know i was difficult i watched my brother he was the same way you know he was he was a challenging kid and a little bit uglier i might add because he's not here to defend himself (laughs) (laughs) Uh, they don't worry he would argue the the opposite side of that if he was here but um but yeah i mean that that's the thing is that teenage boys are difficult especially kids who come out of places of trauma mm-hmm. and i know mm-hmm. that caseworkers have a hard time finding placements for those kids i i've turned down a few placements over the last several months where i've gotten several phone calls and i keep telling them no i'm not taking in a 15 year old boy i have a 15 year old girl in my house i'm not mm, no that that's not the place for this kid trust me uh, we don't need that kind of stuff you know that kind of problems right. happening so uh you know 
they usually let let up on after we get to that point. But yeah, it's it's, it's a really difficult place to when you as a caseworker are trying to find a, a home for a child who who is seen as a more difficult placement before you know just on the numbers alone. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. And it, it was hard, and it is hard. I think for it continues to be hard, but yet they still need care. And I think people who can really work well with them. And it does take, I think, a gift and just an inclination of wanting to help that certain population. Yeah, I, I think that part of foster being a foster parent is truly, it's a calling. It's more, more than anything else. It's, it's just a calling. You, you need to feel called to. And that's what part of the reason why we take in so many young ones. And, you know, we're specifically, we do a we, we're really comfortable dealing with babies who are, who are addicted to, to some sort of substance. And that's just how God wired us. And so mm-hmm. that's that's where we really lean in. And a lot of people are scared of that. But Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I would do with that. That would be really hard. See, and, you know, if I think for me, I'd be, more, I'd be, if I, we thought about actually doing foster parenting. So we will see if we dive into that journey. That's something my husband and I, maybe we'll have a different conversation after that happens. However, yes, you know, I think you might be gifted with a different type of kiddo. You know, you guys do really well with babies, which is amazing. Yeah, we, we, we love babies and I don't know. I, it's so easy for me to take a a little one who's screaming at me because I've, I've met grown adults who are withdrawn off of the hard stuff. And Mm -hmm. so when I meet a newborn baby who is withdrawing off of fentanyl or heroin or methamphetamines mm. or some combination thereof because we've seen just about all of those i i just i get it like i see grown adults who can't handle it and this is a baby who was born into that it's i can't even get mad at them when they scream i would be screaming too you know mm. come on man like <laughs> Like I'm looking at that, like that's, that's who, that's where I would be. I'd be laying there screaming and I'm a grown man. So I can't get mad at you, but that's, that's how we're wired. And so I think, I think we all have our, have our um, calling in life. And for some of us, it's foster care. For some of us, it's an age specific population or, you know, something like that. But I, I just always encourage people like, I think God put us here for a reason. And you just need to figure out what it is that sets your soul on fire and go do that thing. Right. Yeah, That's it's awesome. it's so important to 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 chase the thing that that has some passion in your life that makes it worthwhile because as uh as I've mentioned to many people in the past, I I know too many too many adults who spend all week long going to work complaining about their family so they can go home on the weekend and drink beer and watch sports and complain about work and then come Monday morning it's the same routine week after week after week after week and that's just there's not much in that experience I don't think of life Right. Right. So I say that to say that, yeah, you you definitely need to, to look at becoming foster parents because it sounds like you've got the experience. So, yeah, we're, we're going to bring you right on into the group and you can be crazy like us. <laughs> yeah. I, I, and I also, it's, I just saw so many great, you know, great placements. And uh, even if it was hard, like it was still great. You know, it was it was just like it, the kid got what they needed and they became part of a family and it, 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 that's just beautiful to see. It's, it's just something you can't, you continue to like want to do it, I think, because you see like what a difference it makes for a kid. Yeah, because honestly, they're all hard. They're either difficult to go through as a kid's, you know, going through some hard stuff that makes it difficult inside of your family, or if everything goes wonderfully, the end is always hard. Yeah. You know, I remember one little guy, you know, actually it was him and his sister who was with us who, who we, we kind of thought like hey, they were going to be long-termers in our home. You know, they stayed with us for a year and a half, but their their biological father got his stuff together. Um, he got away from the mom who had a lot of drug issues. He got his life together. He got, he was started to do the right things in his life. He got promoted to his job. He got everything put together and he became a father again and he got his kids back. And that's, I mean, the best possible place for these kids, right, is to be raised in their home. Now, I will say that the judge did not have much, um, didn't have much forethought in, into how we did that because he chose Mother's Day to send them for us to send them home, and that was that oh. was a tough day for my wife. Sure. 
Yeah, because after a year and a half, and this little boy, he, his his biological mother was not a not a very good human and had abused him in many ways. And so when my wife showed him love, like like he and her attached ridiculously mm-hmm. tight. It was it was a really difficult time to see that bond be broken for her and for him because I know it was hard for him too to walk away from that. But, you know, at the end of the day, it was a place he needed to be. Yeah. Yeah. And so yeah, this this has been quite the journey for us to figure out how to walk through uh how to walk through these things. But well, Jenna, I, I want to thank you for coming in here and, and talking about your experience in dealing with kids, whether it's foster or adoptive kids, kids who you serve through your own practice, working with the traumatic brain gen- injury stuff, because there's there's a lot out there and we all need to do our part, whatever that is. And it sounds like even if I don't talk you into going and getting your foster care license started tomorrow, <laughs> you're still helping a lot of kids. Yes. Yes, I think so. Yeah. So I just empower foster parents. You know, you can certainly just continue to be curious and ask questions, speak up. That's the best thing that you can do. I think regarding if you're seeing a kid with a different brain and maybe, you know, someone who has been through trauma or has, you know, ADHD or some other kind of cognitive issue. Oh yeah. Yeah. Cause we could, we could talk cognitive issues all day long because uh, we we have seen most of them along the line some way, whether ADD, ADHD, ODD, all the alphabet soup, RAD. Mm-hmm. It, it's, it's things that we have seen come into our family, and it's finding professionals, you know, like you, who are working with kids who who really help us understand these diagnoses and work with these kids through their hard places. Awesome. Okay, Foster Care Nation, thank you for listening to Jen's story. Now take her knowledge and wisdom to heart so you can create love and healing in your family and community. Be sure to come back next week. We have a new episode every Tuesday. If you'd like to share your story as a guest, you can reach us at jason at fostercarenation.com. You can connect with other like-minded people on Facebook at facebook.com slash groups slash fostercareuj. Don't forget, we have a Patreon account where you can support our mission for as little as $5 a month. It's at patreon.com slash fostercarenation. The links to everything are in the show notes in your podcast player or at fostercarenation.com. And as always, you are so super awesome. I thank you guys. So cool, cool, cool. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for listening. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Unparalleled Studios. Studios.